The 25th Hour Radio Show. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to the 25th Hour Radio Show here on Monster Radio AM 1150. I am your host, Rob Fairless, and on the phone with me today is Toad the Wet Sprocket lead singer and solo artist Glenn Phillips. Glenn has a new solo album titled Swallowed by the New uh, that officially becomes available to the general public on October 7th. Glenn, thanks for taking a few minutes out of your day to join me on the show. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure. Uh, Glenn, let's stick to tradition here on the show and uh, talk first about your beginnings in music. How old were you when you first started getting into it, and what was your inspiration behind wanting to learn to play yourself? Uh I mean, main inspiration was probably my brother. He was a keyboard player and a drummer and serious musician. So I picked up a guitar and decided that would be my thing so I could be more like him. Uh, like, you know, still have my own thing. Uh, yeah, like junior high, was in choir and had a band called Destiny that uh, was trying to be Rush, except that I couldn't play or sing <laughs> high. And... Uh, I remember we played, like, our only gig ever was at the theater at our junior high, and somebody threw milk at my bass. I was trying to be Getty Lee and not pulling it off, and I just remember a milk carton exploding on my bass. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, we did that, and then, you know, Toad started, I guess I was 14 or 15 when I met Todd, you know, it was in theater and choir at high school. I was a freshman, and they were all seniors, and... Didn't imagine that it was going to be uh, what took up the next thirty years of my life. Yeah. Now, now you were you mentioned being a teenager when you started Toad uh, the Wet Sprocket. Uh, now, if I'm not mistaken, it wasn't too long after that that the band signed a record deal, like a couple of years after the formation, right? Uh yeah, pretty much. I mean, we got signed when I was eighteen, so uh, we'd recorded our first two records, Bread and Circus and Pale. We'd done those independently put them out in town and, uh, or at least bread and circus. We never got around to putting out pale cause we had a, but it, right after we finished it, we ended up getting signed. Um, and Sony re-released those records nationally. But, uh, yeah, I mean, first record, I was 16, 17. I mean, when we made beer, I was 19 when we started recording it, which was the first real major label. So, we got three records done before I was 20. Yeah, and you know what, man? What was it like for you at that time still being a teenager and, and having all your musical dreams, I guess, come true? I mean, I remember how I was when I was a teenager, and there would be there would have been no way I could have handled the type of success uh, you had at that age. I mean, did you live uh, the stereotypical rock and roll lifestyle, or, or were you beyond your years in wisdom and always thinking about the future? Uh, well, less of that. I mean, I met... Uh, my wife, uh, my former wife and I, we split like two years ago. We were together 25 years and we met when I was 18. So I was in a relationship that I stuck with. I had friends I really cared about and I've, I've never been, I mean, you know, it's not like, I don't know. I, I was never, uh, an abuser of anything. Yeah. So I didn't, you know, I didn't snort it all up my nose and, uh, I just didn't get in that world at all. I had really good friends and good community, and I felt like a solid base from the beginning. Uh -huh. um, and aside from that, I always felt like the dream part was kind of somebody else's dream. Like, I knew that as an abstract, it would be interesting to be successful, but I never expected it, and uh, I didn't, I was always kind of skeptical of it. And, I mean, I had the feeling since, I don't know, I had a, a teacher in high school, my theater teacher, who described the reason he was a teacher was because he knew he had a thin skin. Like, he loved the theater more than anything, but he also knew he didn't have that competitive ego that would have made it so he could have been an actor in L.A. or New York. You know, he was too sensitive. And... I, I remember being like 14 and sitting in his class and going, hey, it's me. And I decided I was going to be a, probably an arts teacher, maybe social sciences, maybe sociology, anthropology. But um, I knew that I did not want to have people writing reviews of my music or publicly <laughs> insulting me. And I knew it would hurt too much. And 
then it ended. So, and then we ended up getting set, signed anyway. Uh, <laughs> so it was, it was on the one hand, uh, kind of a dream, but it was on the other, some, on the other hand, something I already knew that I wasn't really cut out for. Uh, cause it, it did hurt a little too much. Like every bad review and every, you know, it's like, it, it's, uh, it can be hard to take. You got to really have a super strong ego and, and I don't. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, so it, it made it a difficult place for me to be, which I mean, it's supposed to be everybody's dream, but I think the reality of it is different than that. I, I kind of knew that at an early age. Well, that's cool. And, and just to move forward, because, if you are a fan of music in general, uh, you know Toad the Wet Sprocket. You know all the hits uh, you guys in the band have, uh, or you in the band have produced. Uh, so let's focus on you as a solo artist. Now, being someone who is the front man for such a well-known band, what was the motivation for you to have wanted to put out a solo album in the first place, speaking of your very first solo album? We probably should have made solo records earlier. I don't think we would have... Bro- I mean, at that point, it was because we'd broken up. Yeah. And I was still writing songs. And, you know, I had, I did have enough ego to want to say, hey, hey, still writing songs. <laughs> I'm here, I'm here, yeah. You know, I'm here, even though I'm not <laughs> called Toad. Guess, guess who wrote all those words you like? Uh, you know? And so... Uh, so, I mean, part of it's that, uh, and it was what I knew how to do. It's like the way I fed my family and I needed to keep feeding my family. Uh, and so, you know, I, I gotta say around the time of Abulon though, I was, I was in a deep depression. I mean, I went on stage, I went on tour when that record was out and I got letters after that just saying, man, if you don't want to be out, out on the road, don't go out on the road. Like, I, I was so depressed and I'm an anxious depressive. So I do things when I'm depressed, mm-hmm. but I really should have just, I should have checked myself into, into an institution because <laughs> I was, I was a, a wreck and I think I drove a lot of people away. Uh, the, uh, you know, part of it was that, I mean, the band broke up, you know, we were, we were not doing well. It was definitely time for us to break up. And, you know, I didn't know how to start another band. The first band that happened was an accident. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I was happy to put out some music on my own. It seemed like the next logical thing to do. Now, you know, I've always been curious when it comes to musicians, and especially musicians who have been fortunate enough, uh, like you said, to pay the bills just with their music. Now that you're older, is it hard to connect with songs that you wrote at a younger age, or do the songs keep you connected to your youth? Um, it, it depends on the song. I mean, there's a lot of songs I would have written differently, uh, but it's, uh, how can I say this? It's like, you know, you know, we've been playing, it's the 25th anniversary of here, so Toad's been playing that record. I don't feel, you know, I was 19. I don't feel like I was a very mature writer at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same time, it was some heavy subject matter. And I appreciate that, you know, I've seen bands where, you know, people are 60 and all their songs are about being 20 and, you know, getting laid and getting drunk. And uh, they're kind of embarrassing to sing when you're 60. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, and my songs are about, being uncertain and having a lot of feelings. <laughs> like, I'm still pretty uncertain and I still have a lot of feelings, so I feel like, hey, I can grow up with those songs. You know, they're about keeping your integrity when it's hard to keep your integrity or really trying to ask what things really mean. And, you know, none of those, I feel like what I'm proud of with Toad and with the stuff I wrote when I was young is that, uh, yeah, I wasn't, wasn't writing about kid stuff. You know, I was still trying to think about things that were are still important to me uh so yeah it's good that way so as far as your latest album swallowed by the new how would you describe the feel of it to your fans out there or perhaps even someone who is stumbling onto your music for the very first time what was the mindset of glenn phillips when putting this album together um 
I mean, it's a very, it's, you know, more in an Americana vein. It's very stripped down and focused on the songs. Um, and it's a very, uh, how can I say it? It's a, it's a weedy album. You know, it was written after divorce, after 25 years. It was written, you know, kids going off to college, like a, a major life change. And I hadn't had a major life change in a while. And, uh, you know, since I was 18, really. And so, um, it, you know, and was written, I recorded it about a year ago. And so it was written in the middle of the process. So on the one hand, there's a lot of pain in it. Uh, on the other hand, you know, some of the songs are about loneliness and losing home, and a lot of the songs are really about facing change bravely, uh, about understanding the transition isn't just injury, but it's an opportunity to grow. And, like, these songs were really, you know, they were the tools, the conceptual tools that I used to get through that period. And, you know, a year later, I'm... I wouldn't have bet on it <laughs> at a certain point, but I'm happier than I've been in, a, in probably in a couple decades. I feel like I don't, you know, that my baseline, like I got to redefine my life and look at my decisions and look at how I wanted to be grateful for the things in my life and, uh, you know, grateful to my former wife, grateful to all the years we had together, grateful that we both got a chance to start again. And we both are happier, you know, on the other side of it. And so it's, it's a good record if you've uh, recently been through a major breakup or lost somebody you love. It's not morbid either, but it's, but it's a heavy record. Uh, but I think it's an important one. So as far as the first single you released off the album, Amnesty, a uh, great song, by the way. I've been playing it over and over this morning, getting myself pumped up for this well, thank interview. You. Yeah. Uh, why was that chosen to be the lead single off this album? Uh, because it was one of the only up-tempo songs on the record. <laughs> I got you, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a good singable chorus. Yeah, it's got a nice hook to it. Yeah, it. Absolutely, it catches you yeah, from the very beginning. there you go. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it, huh? All right, no problem with that. That's about it. <laughs> Uh, now, of course, you got to love all the songs on the album or they wouldn't be on there. Uh, but do you have your own personal favorites that you might have a deeper connection to? I mean, the most important song to me is Grief and Praise, just because that was, I mean, it's weird. There's this, you know, the first song I wrote in this group of songs, I've been trying not to write a breakup song. I promised myself I wouldn't write a breakup record. And then I got involved in this songwriting group with this guy Matt the Electrician who's out of Austin and you know he sends out an email with a song title every week and then you know like 15 whatever it was 17 at the time songwriters you know the next a week later everybody emails back a song that title and the first title was Reconstructing the Diary I'm like oh that's a breakup song and I wrote that and then it was Leaving Old Town it's like oh that's a breakup song and so I started writing it writing about the material through these titles, they really freed me up to write the songs I needed to write. And the first ones were really about loss. And then the last one, uh, it's called Grief and Praise, and it's, uh, it, it's based on this concept by Martine Crectel. And I wrote this song like three days into the recording of the record. Um, and I knew there were just things I had to say that I hadn't said on the record but I needed to thank my wife. I needed to thank my children. I needed to really own up to what had changed. And, uh, and it's this, this idea, uh, Martine Pretzel talks about grief and praise, and that it, they're both the expression of love in the face of inevitable loss. And so that grief is praising the things you love and have lost, and praise is grieving the things you love and will lose. And they're just the mirror of the same act. And, uh, you know, I was in this thing, of, you know, how do you face loss with gratitude? And, uh, you know, I, and I, I think it's something, you know, for anybody, it's like we, we try not to think about it most of the time, but we're going to lose the people we love. We lose our parents or our parents lose us. 
you know? Mm-hmm. Things change. Parts of our lives go. We lose our job. The economy, you know, it's like all these things. And, and mostly we try to kind of gloss over and just move on. And there's, you know, you don't want to lose yourself to grief. You don't want to just wallow. And uh, But at the same time, like, it's a way of honoring how much you love things to understand how much they can hurt you. And there's a bravery after you've lost something and in, in daring to love something again with the knowledge that it's probably going to break your heart at some point. So, um, you know, this record is really about that. It's about like learning to be brave enough to love anything again, whether it's music, whether it's a person. Uh, and you know, it's, a, it's really easy, I think, to shut down and just get by and just survive. And, uh, this album is all about trying not to do that and trying to, trying to figure out how to be brave enough to, to open up again, get hurt again. Now, it has to be the best feeling in the world to have a new album coming out. You know, the anticipation of it all. Do you get nervous at all at moments like this? You know, especially now that we have social media and you, and, and you get that instant um, feedback on pretty much anything going on in the world? Yes and no. You get instant feedback, but also statistically nobody buys records anymore. So it's a, it's a strange. Uh, They're coming back. Man. They're making a comeback. I don't know if the album is worth. Oh well, we'll see. No, I mean it, it. I'm not taking it personally. It's just more like, you know, you can't. It's exciting to have this thing come out because I feel like there's a certain creative constipation that can happen when you've made a personal record, especially about a period of life that's so distinct, like. Feel, I mean, I've written a lot of co-write songs and, you know, things that are for other people or without myself in mind, but I feel like getting this record out uh, frees me up creatively to really look into my next project, and that's the most exciting thing about it. Uh, I feel like, not that I've been stuck on this material, but I had to make this record then I had to wait a year after the record was made to just heal, to kind of get on the other side, to find out, like, hey, I'm happy. Like, I actually love my life right now. And I, I you know, I'm, I'm astounded that I can say I love my life right now. And, uh, and so to put the record out in that state and then get to say, hey, what do I want to say now? That's the most exciting thing to me. Uh, so we'll, whether, whether people hear the album or not, you know, it depends on if people find the story compelling. It's about a bunch of stuff that people don't like to think about. It sounds morbid, you know? <laughs> and so, but I think, honestly, like, you know, when you meet people, like, who've had a major loss, like, they can choose whether to get crushed by it or whether to have a rebirth. You know, you meet people who've gone through cancer and, like, some people get really scared and some people just, like, light up, and it's like their life started as soon as they got to cancer. And, like, I, I feel, uh, so I'm feeling, yeah, right now I'm just kind of inspired to do, do what's next. Now, as far as performing, you're about to uh, hit the road again, right, soon to promote this album? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm going to go out in Texas uh, with Sean Watkins uh, in October, and then I'm going to go... November with my friend Jonathan Kingham uh, up the West Coast, and then uh, yeah, March, March, uh, March and April, uh, going to do some trio touring in the states. So touring is imminent. And I want to point out that Glenn has his own website, glennphillips.com, and you can go there and get all the solo tour dates plus links to uh, Glenn's social media pages. Glenn, before we wrap things up, uh, do you have any final words, anything I failed to mention, maybe a quick thank you to all your fans out there who have supported you throughout the years? Yeah. All I would say is please share it, tell people about it if it means something to you, uh, and uh, if it means something to you, thank you. I want to mention once again, Glenn's new album is called Swallow by the New. It will be available October 7th. Glenn, thanks again for taking a few minutes out of your day to join me on the show. Yeah, thank you. Take care. The 
25th Hour Radio Show.